We can do better. Maybe we can bring better outcomes to these individuals. Um, let's go through a little bit of some of the things with this. Um, we currently have Missouri neighboring states, Illinois, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Tennessee that are using some form uh, of this performance funding for higher ed. Florida just unanimously passed earnings-based funding for colleges in 2021. So there are other states that have done this and have done it successfully. Um, you want to align students and institutions and taxpayers' interests all in one place. I think that's important. Um, higher ed performance funding ties institutions for state funding to, to the student outcomes that we're talking about. You know, the days where students go there just to expand their minds. I can remember when that was a thing when you go into higher ed. We we're going to go there, expand our mind. And I think that's still a good thing that we do at times. But as a person that's paid for two students who went to college, I personally wanted them to do more than just expand their minds. I wanted them to be prepared to be able to get a job where they could take care of their family, their kids, and for the future themselves. And so I think it's a little bit more than that anymore. It's great that we're expanding our mind, and colleges do a great job of that. And, but I think we can do so much more to make sure that these, these students go on and can provide for their families. So let's look at the performance score composition. I would ask this to the committee. I'm more than willing to try to answer them, but there's going to be a person that's going to testify that can probably get deeper into the performance funding of it and crunch the numbers and answer some of those. So I'll do my best to answer the questions for you. There's somebody that will testify in a minute that can probably do a much better job of that. But let's look at some of the things that are in there. For the universities, 20% is on Pell enrollment. 25% deals with Pell alumni earnings. 30% is alumni earnings. 10% deals with graduate school or employment. And 15% deals with public service focus and employment. And let me explain that portion. That one I think is important. One thing we don't want to do with outcome base is say it's all about how much money you earn. I went into education. I had an education degree. You're not going to earn as much in education as you do if you're an engineer or an accountant. Does that mean it's any worse? No. And my, I've probably argued with anybody who said that that's not just as important to be a teacher and to educate our kids. Same thing with policemen. Social workers. Do we need social workers? Very much so. Do we pay them probably what they're worth? No. So would that drive down some university and would some university possibly say, we, we don't want to do social work degrees because it hurts us on this. So that's why we have that section here because we don't believe that you should devalue those ones that people go into for the good of our communities, the good of our state, and the betterment of our kids. We don't want to devalue what they bring to the table, and I think this bill in no way does that. And In fact, if it did, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring the bill forward. I think we want to make sure that we are bringing values to these institutions um, if I remember right, I think Springfield University of Missouri State may turn out more teachers than anybody. I know SEMO has a huge teacher education program, and we wouldn't want to do anything that would sit there and they'd say, well, that may cost us money, so we don't want to do that. Same way with these others. So those are some of the things. For the two-year institutions, it's based on 30% Pell enrollment, 30% Pell alumni earnings, and 40% alumni earnings. And I keep going to Pell. Why is that so important? Well, let's look at it. Uh, Pell takes some of these students who maybe their families haven't had the ability to go to college. Maybe uh, they don't have the financial backing from their, from their family to be able to do it. So they fill out the FAFSA. They find out that, they're, that their expected efficiency is maybe, you know, $2,000 or $1,000 instead of some of the others. And so they, can, they see the realization they can go to college. And we know that the outcomes for these after their family contribution, a lot of times these students still do not make. Um, all universities have a lower graduation for Pell students. That's one thing. And a lot of times they don't come out because of, of some of the things they've dealt with throughout their life. So we want to make sure that we, again, incentivize universities to want to educate these students, to take them on and do the best job possible. So with that, I know there's probably going to be a lot of questions. I'll answer some. Again, I would ask that if you go real deep in the formula, maybe give this next gentleman in a minute that will come up to testify in support of the bill a chance to come up here because I think he can get very deep into the weeds of that, but maybe that gives you an outline of the bill. Questions for this witness? 
Yes, Representative Adams, please proceed. To inquire, Madam Chairman. Yes, please Thank proceed. You. Thank you for coming this afternoon uh, and presenting this intriguing uh, concept. Uh, basically, are we attempting to get rid of the formula that we use now to fund the Mizzou system and the other public schools in the state of Missouri? It is my understanding that really we probably haven't been using a funding formula. A lot of it's been by the by the budget department budget committee mm -hmm. that is funding these universities and sending money on to higher ed. I know we had a formula way back. My understanding again was that it wasn't fully instituted, and I'd like to see us come up with a formula that we use on a on a yearly basis. Um, I think it would make it easier for higher ed to also, I mean, excuse me, for the budget committee to take this on and look at it and, and use it. That doesn't mean we take out of their hands that they couldn't do other things. They're still the budget committee. But try to look at it from this perspective. Okay. How, how do you propose to keep track of the Pell graduates' annual earnings? That's in there, and I w could I ask this question? Could I ask you to maybe go to the next gentleman because he knows how we can use the Department of Labor, I think, is one of the areas where we can do that. There's several ways to track it, but he he's going to know a lot, give you a better answer. I can try to look through the bill, through my notes, but I think he can answer that question for you at length. Okay, I'll wait then. Thank you very much. Um, Representative Pfeiffer, please proceed. Thank you very much to inquire. Yes. Uh, we saw this last year. And uh, I, I realize it comes from the Cicero Institute, uh, which is not from the state of Missouri. One of the things I keep hearing on the floor of the House is that we need to stop uh, relying on out-of-state organizations to come in and tell us how to run the state. So um, I, I would just like to learn a little bit more about Cicero Institute. That would be great. And, and let me tell you this. They brought some of the numbers. They've crunched some of the numbers for us, but I think this can be a Missouri bill. I think this thing may change over time. I'm not saying we have the final version that gets passed and signed in by the governor, but I think we have to start having the conversation about outcomes-based funding for these institutions. Um, but this did originate with an outside group. Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Representative Greyer, please proceed. Thank you to uh, inquire and briefly comment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to I want to express my appreciation for you bringing this bill forward. I know it's the second year that we've heard it. Um, I think it's a tremendous opportunity for Missouri to put some accountability around the process um, of how we do this and also incentivize outcomes. I think that's what our constituents want. We hear it again and again, especially the last year or two. Um, our, our constituents want this type of thing to be put into place. Um, so I, I commend you on that. Um, does this bill encourage apprenticeships? Um, yes, I would think it would, yes. It does. It absolutely does. I'm um, sitting here thinking of the bill. I've got a lot of things in my mind, but yes, it would. Yes, and, and I think that's a really important thing because that's, it, it also incentivizes and encourages the universities to be communicating with, this, with the workforce and with our employers in the state of Missouri um, to make sure that there's alignment between what they are actually, the skills that they are providing to students and putting them into the workforce align with what the workforce needs actually are. Um, so I think that's a really tremendous part of the bill as well. And, you know, I'll, I'll just want to comment really briefly um, about this whole idea of, you know, outside groups bringing ideas to Missouri and telling Missourians what we're supposed to do. I, as a legislator, I look for good ideas, and I look for them all over the place. I look for uh, other places that have incorporated ideas that we have here in Missouri and have been effective in them. You know, we don't have a monopoly on great ideas in Missouri. There's a lot of really good ideas from all over the country and, in fact, all over the world. And some of the greatest bills that we've passed here in Missouri in the last couple of years have come from help from these outside groups that have been able to engage with us and help refine the ideas that we have as Missourians that are best for Missourians and make them even better. So I think this bill is a great combination of all those things. And again, I want to commend you on your efforts for bringing this forward. And I hope to see that it's successful and we can get this across the finish line. You've got my support. Thank you very much. And I would say with what you said along those lines, 
because it originated somewhere else doesn't mean we can't make it Missouri's model. Thank you. Um, Representative Veet, please proceed. To inquire of the witness. Yes. You and I had talked earlier, but, and I agree, outcome based, so I'm in business. I understand that concept. I understand it all. But we also have to recognize there are certain universities, such as those that are open enrollment to land grant universities, probably need to be treated a little bit different, do they not? I, I would agree with that. Thanks. Representative Black. Thank you to inquire, Madam Chair. Um, please proceed. Thank you. Gentlemen, I'm looking at your factors here in the subsection three, page two of the bill. First one is average earning of students at six and 10 years. If I'm reading it correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong. At six and 10 years out. Page two, gentlemen. I know, and I'm sitting here trying to find my page two. I apologize, but for some reason, I got every page but page two sitting right here in front of me. But I've got more than one copy of it, so give me one second. I'll, I'll be glad to. Okay, now I'm on page two. Thank you. First factors, uh, earnings, looks like six and ten years out. Uh, the next one is earnings, and that's a 30% weight. The next one is earnings. Pell Grant students six and ten years out. So both those are related to the earnings uh, with a cumulative 55% uh, weight, it looks to me like. Then uh, just a proportion who are Pell Grant at 20 and proportion who uh, engaged in these, uh, let's call them social good uh, careers at 15% and then 10% for Students going to graduate school, if I, do I understand it correctly? You do. Um, so with regard, and as, to follow up on the previous question, with regard to the different missions of schools, some are heavy on graduate education, some are not so heavy on graduate education. And my understanding is you've attempted to take that into consideration to some degree, is that right? That is correct, and I will tell you up front, this is where we're at, I believe, in the bill, but does that mean that it's perfect? No. As we run through these numbers, I think this starts the conversation that we have to do, just like the land grant. He had a good point on the land grant universities, and I think we're probably going to have to look at that at some point in the bill. It's a discussion we've had already. So if, if a student, let's say, goes to graduate school, let's say goes to law school or med school, um, and they in fact get that well-paid professional degree. When you go back to factor number one and look at the earnings of students who graduated from the undergraduate institution uh, six and 10 years ago, would their earnings as a result of the subsequent uh, professional degree be included in those earnings that are calculated under factor one? I'm going to, I'm going to, because now we're getting into to that, I would think they would be, but I'm going to let the, the gentleman that's going to be here in a minute maybe try to answer that question for you. Okay. Thank you, Because I, I, I agree with the factors. I know there's, there's different methods of following. If you look in there, there's a two, two uh, rolling average and some different things as we deal with some of these factors, but I don't want to misspeak, and I'm going to let him tell you for sure how it was figured originally here. Thank you. Yes, Representative Windham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon. Good Jason. afternoon. So I, I, I need to go through the fiscal note uh, and quite honestly the bill again at another time or two because the, the bill has a lot of definitions. So I, I figured I'd just wait for the fiscal note to, to come in and it, it I, I don't know that the committee has had even 24 hours with the fiscal note yet. Uh, last year it had a breakdown of each institution and how how they would fare, and I wish that it was the same. And just flipping through real quick, it doesn't it doesn't have that. So I'm guessing that you don't have a breakdown of of how it would affect each each school. The way I've got it right here is it shows that basically they're they're having one FTE. Well, I, I meant like how it would uh, affect Harris Stowe and then how it affect the total Lincoln dollar amount. The, right. I do not have that right now. No. Okay. 
um, because the bill last year, and it seems like like this bill too, kind of um, is a it's a, it's a zero sum game. It seems so. It, it just says that of the money that we appreciate uh, appropriate, a certain amount has to go here or there, right? I, it does. I think I can answer a little bit of the question you had before. Cool. I do have this that shows me it doesn't have the dollar amount, but it says which ones are do better on some of these different factors, which okay. may help you a little bit. Like Pell student enrollment, four-year institutions, Harris Stowe and Lincoln do very well. So does Missouri State University. Under public service graduate employment in Missouri, Harris Stowe, Lincoln and Southeast Missouri State, you do very well. So we did break it down by some of them who do very well. Now, if you look at earnings outcomes, it's going to be university, it's going to be RALA, you know, uh, Missouri S and T. It's going to be in University of Missouri at Columbia, Kansas City, Truman State, University of Missouri at St. Louis. Beat them in the earnings income. If you look at graduate employment, Lincoln, Harrisstow, uh, University of Missouri at St. Louis, Southeast Missouri, and Missouri Western do well. So I've got a breakdown, and I would be happy to share that with you as we after we get done of some of the breakdowns by university who does well and so, some of the different factors. Yes, I think that would that's pertinent information uh, for sure. Uh, but then. I, I say all that in, in the wind up to say, do you think that we fund higher education enough right now? We haven't in the last, we, I know we didn't increase two year, and I'm more familiar with probably the junior colleges and the funding on the four year, to be real honest with you, but I know we haven't increased them. You know, we held them stagnant for a long time. So probably the answer is if you look at today's real dollars with inflation, we haven't. Okay. Um, and, and then do you, can we, in, in statute, I mean, I, I guess we can do it, but can we restrict or can we technically say how the budget committee appropriates this money? Would the budget chair still be able to put the money where the budget chair or the, the body fit, uh, sees fit? I would say that they can, and my only reason behind this, I haven't researched this, I guess, at length, but if you look at the funding formula for, for uh, K-12, okay, we fund that formula. But then all the time we do some other things like we can decide how much is going to go. We could decide that we're going to fund transportation up to a higher level or we're going to fund at a lower level. And we have fully funded for several years the formula, but for years past we would not. And then we'd have or we would put in a certain amount and then we would have withholdings throughout the year. So I think there's some flexibility in what you do with those fun funding formulas. Okay. Um, and, and then how I, I think that there's some issues currently even around um, data gathering when it comes to graduation rates or I'm, I'm guessing then too along that same line uh, earnings uh, so if a student goes from one institution to another uh, without uh, matriculating through the institution, uh, then they don't necessarily count for that institution's graduation rate. I think we've got a way to do that, and I'm going to let the, again, I don't want to put off your question. I'm trying to answer every question can, but sure. I think he'll be able to answer that question for you. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll wait for that. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yes, Representative Pfeiffer. To inquire. Yes, sir. Do you happen to know exactly where these um, the information about earnings comes from? Because some of it doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, uh, some of it's through the labor department that we can get some of that. But again, I think you can get your answer fully. I can try to give you the best answer I've got, but I think that the gentleman that's going to talk can probably tell you fully where, where he's taken it to come up with where some of this would yeah, go. A, a number of the schools show almost flat earnings or decreased earnings between two and ten years, which is very um, puzzling to me. It does not make sense to me that the average at um, Lincoln University, for example, I thought a little bit of the same thing, to be honest with you. I, I, I was a little puzzled by that less number. After ten, that just doesn't make sense. Um, so I'm, I'm really concerned about where these figures come from, which leads me to my concern about this this whole idea. Well, and uh, I would say this. Um, we ultimately, if, if we pass this bill into law, we can decide where they would get these. So, so this doesn't mean that any of this couldn't change when you say you have a concern about the bill based on this alone. This 
these type of things can be changed. We go through the bill process, which we do all the time, too, I if we have my, a problem. My larger concern is just getting good data and then basing mm -hmm. all of our funding on that. Thank you very much. And, and I want nothing but the best data if we can get. Good. Yes, Representative Riggs, please proceed. Oh, you're good? I think I'll wait personally until your, um, until your witnesses show up. Does anybody else have any questions of the bill sponsor? If not, thank you very much, um, Representative. Our first um, um, person to, to testify in favor of the bill, if you'll please come forward and state your name and turn your witness form. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jared Meyer, and I'm executive director of Cicero Action, which is a nonprofit policy organization based in Austin, Texas. And the uh, idea or the reform that led to this bill that I shared with Representative Henderson was eight years ago, the Texas State Technical Colleges switched their whole uh, funding formula from really where Missouri is today to one that was based on 100% student earnings. Now that is clearly not what this bill does, but the outcomes were unbelievable. In less than a decade, average earnings over doubled. All the schools had a much greater incentive to push apprenticeships and really connect people with employers. And we've been working very closely with the chancellor of that system as he tries to spread the message of creating the right incentives can create a better return for both taxpayers and the students who are attending these universities. So this bill is clearly a Missouri spin on that idea. And again, it's something that looks different in every state with well over half of states having performance funding for higher education institutions. But to answer some of the questions, uh, just to walk through where some of this data can come from, for the earnings portion, that would all come from state UI records. So this would look at people primarily who are employed as W-2 employees in Missouri. And then in, under the bill, it allows the department to enter into dating sh data sharing agreements with neighboring states, like Kansas and Missouri, I know have a data sharing agreement right now for some forms of UI data. Uh, and for the Pell recipient earnings and enrollment, that would come from the FAFSA, which the uh, department gets from the federal government already every year. Uh, for the public service graduates who are employed in their field in Missouri, that would look at the UI data to figure out which industry they're employed in along with the degree that they've studied. And for graduates who are in the workforce or continuing education, that is the National Student uh, Clearinghouse, which covers which students came from one, let's say, undergraduate institution to a graduate program. So. That's where some of the data comes from. Uh, unfortunately, as a nonprofit group, we can't look at every piece of data that the government has. I mean, that's an important protection for people's privacy. But we were able to use some older data and kind of take a static view of where some universities would end up coming out. And compared to last year's bill, I think this is a great improvement that really fits what Missouri is trying to accomplish because all schools will be given much more time to start teaching uh, the programs that they think will help their students the best and aligning their incentives and maybe changing some of their connections to employers. So uh, this, you know, I think is a very interesting bill and I want to congratulate Representative Henderson for working with so many stakeholders and really improving the bill from last year. Uh, the general idea is right now, we need, uh, Missouri schools, they're doing a great job in a lot of areas, but that doesn't mean there can't be improvement. This is competitive with every state competing for talent, competing for businesses. There's got to be a way to drive Missouri even further forward and create more value for both taxpayers and students. But with that, I want to use any other time to help answer any questions the committee may have. Okay, so I will, I will start. So the uh, medium annual earnings, um, so is that is not actually individuals' income. It's for people who graduated from the university um, this one is 10 years previously. That's just the aggregate? Uh, so, Madam Chair, that would be from people who matriculated at the university, so when they started. So whether they graduated or not, if they are employed, their wages would be put into the average. So let's say someone who didn't enter the workforce because of family obligations or was continuing their education, they wouldn't count positively or negatively in the earnings portion because they are not employed. Uh, similarly, some of the other points that are not covered under W-2 wages would be independent contractors, people in the military, and people in the clergy. Uh, I will say I talked with the chancellor of the Texas system, and he was able to find 98% of alumni's earnings. 
by using surveys and other methods to try to get at the smaller portion of under 10% that wouldn't be captured in W-2. And so also speaking of the Texas um, system, the, the formula that they are using, all their schools basically teach the exact same thing because it's their technical schools and they're all doing the same thing versus our university systems are, are, are teaching a variety. In fact, we kind of encourage them not to do overlap. Isn't that correct? Uh, Madam Chair, I would, say, different. Uh, I would say you are correct in that universities often have broader missions than technical schools, but I will say from talking with the chancellor, the school specialized much more into what was needed in the region. So whether one school was focusing more on auto mechanics and another one was focusing on electricians or uh, skilled steel workers, they, they actually led to more specialization so that it wasn't just a cookie cutter curriculum across all schools. And I think it would do the same in Missouri where every part of the state has different needs in the workforce and anything that can further incentivize these schools to meet what their local employers need and what their students want, I think would be a welcome improvement. Okay, um, questions from the committee, yes, I'm Representative Wyndham. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good evening to you. Would you would you say that this is a progressive bill? I would say it is because the focus on Pell recipient uh, earnings and also Pell enrollment is something that's not incentivized under the current funding formula. So right now, a lot of individuals who come or maybe first generation college students, the schools it takes sometimes more work to meet them where they're at and help them succeed and get into family sustaining careers. They don't get a reward for that right now. Under this formula, they would have a massive reward for improving these outcomes and trying to admit more Pell eligible students, which I think is a moral imperative. Okay. Um, are you usually in favor of progressive bills? It, yes, I would say I, I like uh, working on issues that help everyone succeed and reach greater opportunities. Okay. All right. Is Representative Veet. Well, I, I was. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. I was. I was just trying to gather my question. Um, did you Did you write a book about how Americans love the sharing economy and how progressives are, progressive cities are fighting innovation? Yes. But do you think this is a progressive bill, and it, you are usually in favor of progressive bills? Yeah, Representative. I would say it always depends on the definitions we're using, but the point of my book was there are a lot of services that are extending opportunities to lower and working class Americans and some cities that fashion themselves progressive cities were standing in the way of that opportunity. Okay, and do you have uh, exact numbers of how each university would fare if this bill was to be implemented? And Representative, to reiterate, I do not have access to the private data that the state would be able to access but we can use out-of-state data to try to model this on a static uh, method, whereas this bill, as Representative Henderson said, would phase in over many years, and hopefully we would see the same improvement that we saw in a short amount of time in Texas and the other states that used performance funding. So I think any model now, it can be informative, but it's definitely not where things are going to shake out. Well, how did, did you say that you saw Texas's numbers drastically improve? Correct. How did they improve? It wasn't It wasn't just because a formula was put into place. They had to do something to improve the numbers outside of a formula, right? Correct. The Talking with the chancellor and various leaders in the school, once the formula was put in place, they had the incentive to really drive increased alumni success, and that's what they focused on. So it helped jumpstart uh, the successes that they saw with higher graduation rates, higher earnings, more job placements. Okay, but I, I think you kind of started to answer the question, and, and maybe we can we can talk more about it offline. But it, and then you you got more general with it, saying like graduation rates. But how did they get to those graduation rates? It wasn't because a formula was put into place. But um, do does Florida or do, does Texas follow their uh, their funding formula? Yes. Okay. Are you aware that in Missouri we don't follow our funding formula that we have on the books? Yes, because there hasn't been the extra appropriation that would have kicked in and been subject to the funding formula. Okay, so how do you think that, why do you think that this bill is going, we're going to follow this bill if we haven't followed the, the law that we have on the books right now? So this bill as written would apply to the all expenditures category, which is separate from funding for research and other uh, 
priorities that are outside of just general education expenses, so it would apply to the annual appropriation in that category. Okay. Uh, maybe I just didn't get that, but we can talk about that offline again. Um, okay, that's, that's all I got for now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Veet. Oh, you're with Frank? Representative Pfeiffer? Yes, hi. Um, I'm still looking at, at these two sheets of paper. And, and if I read them correctly, one is apples and one is oranges. Um, that uh, at the two-year level, we have graduation. And at the four-year le level, we have matriculation, which are two very different things. Um, am I correct about that? I would have to look at which papers you're looking it's, at. The blue says 10 years post-matriculation. And over here, it's two years post-graduation. Oh, correct. One sheet was trying to model some of the inputs, and the other sheet, which was the yellow one, was trying to look at what the state is currently spending per positive outcome, which is per graduate. So I would view them as separate pieces of information. Uh, the yellow sheet was showing how some schools seem to be doing better on student outcomes per what they're getting from the state. And the other sheet was trying to look at the various factors to see how the funding may shake out if there was no improvement, which I doubt would be the case. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yes, Representative Adams. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just to inquire, this system only works in Texas at the technical schools, not University of Texas at Austin. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And so we're trying to model this program that works with the technical schools, which would be like our, um, oh, God, Lynn. It, it, I had to remember where it was. At Lynn, to Mizzou, correct? Yes, but other states besides Texas use earnings for their university funding formula as well. It's just uh, Texas, to say where we got the idea from or alerted to this sort of reform and brought it to Representative Henderson because he had told me he was focused on workforce preparedness uh, and then tried to update it to fit more with what Missouri needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay, Representative Pfeiffer. And then if it's okay with the committee, I'd like to move on to um, um, someone in opposition. Thank you. One of the questions I did have is looking at that 15%. Do we have any idea how that 15% of, um, I would say, more um, not-for-profit kind of work aligns with our workforce today? Uh, when I think about the number of people who uh, do police work, who do who are firefighters, first responders, who are nurses, who are uh, med tech people, who are teachers, who are pastors, who um, do all those kinds of things that are, are really, frankly, lower paid. How does that? Do we know how that aligns with Missouri's uh, student uh, population? Because it's a fifteen percent weight, and um, I, just eyeballing it, I would suspect that more uh, students matriculate and graduate in those kinds of classes than 15%. Uh, I would have to get back to you on those exact Be numbers, Representative, but one thing I would like to point out is people who graduate in almost all of those fields earn more than the median graduate from any school except from Mizzou two years afterwards. Uh, when you're looking at uh, the high 30s, low 40s, which a lot of the public service occupations pay, and some like nursing pay more than that, uh, it's right in line with other graduates. So our point would be if more people are graduating, they'll start to uh, positively I, impact. I do want to point out the starting salary for a teacher in Missouri is the lowest in the country, it's something like $32,000 a year. So I'm, I'm not sure how that really correlates, but thank you. Okay. I do have one additional question from Representative Black. You just go ahead and ask. That'd be great. Thanks, Madam Chair. The question I asked Representative, uh, who presented the bill, if a with regard to the factors, if a person goes to college at some place at some place, and then later goes to graduate school, professional school at another institution, uh, would the 
would that person's earnings go into the factor for the first institution attended? Yes, Representative, thanks for bringing up that question again. I forgot to get to it. They would absolutely go into that. Further, if someone went to a community college and then transferred for to a four-year program, the community college would also get the credit for the outcome. Thank you. Right. Thank you. For Thank the you very much. Um, our first um, person in opposition. Thank you, and and go ahead and state your name. Go ahead and proceed when you're ready. Okay. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Paul Wagner representing the Council on Public Higher Education. Um, we appreciate the uh, conversation about a funding formula. We're happy to sit at a table and talk about that with anyone who's interested. So um, we uh, are happy that you're talking about it. Um, what's being passed out now is just something I sketched out real quick, um, kind of, which I call a checklist for working towards a higher education funding formula. Nothing that's come down from on high or anything, just kind of my advice as someone who's worked on this kind of thing, both in K-12 and higher ed for longer than I'd like to admit. Um, but first I'll start off talking about some of the reasons that we oppose this bill. Um, first of all, uh, the bill says that this formula would start next fiscal year. So a year from now, the budget you'd be working on a year from now would have to factor in everything in this bill. And as has been discussed, the primary focus of this is the earnings of people who attended six to 10 years ago. So for the foreseeable future, you would be basing your funding off of people that haven't been on campus in quite a while. Um, which kind of begs the question then, how would an institution improve? You know, if we get all this data that, that somehow and we find out there's an institution that's not doing well, what are the options for that institution to improve its score besides calling up people who are in their late 20s and early 30s and saying, hey, we need you to go earn more money? What can an institution do? It's gonna be six to 10 years from now before any students who are on campus now would be factored into this formula. So I don't see how this would be a mechanism to improve institutional performance even on the factor that the bill is focused on. Um, it's been touched on already about how there's not reliable data in this arena. I'll repeat that then. <laughs> the, you know, we had, you know, the, the UI data was mentioned. Um, again, for something like a tech school sector, you know, tech schools do tend to be very localized. They, they serve their community, their local employers, graduates of tech schools rarely move out of state, probably even more so in Texas than a place like Missouri because we have all our major metropolitan institutions, um, and major metropolitan areas right on borders. So um, the ability to get you to use UI data for tech graduates would be much higher than for college graduates as a whole. So data reliability, basing all of our funding on what um, is, is unreliable data would definitely uh, be a, a concern. Um, let me touch on also the concern, uh, the discussion that's happened about the uh, public service graduates, so to speak. Um, again, the, ma the vast majority of the funding in this formula is driven by earnings. The adjustment for uh, education, law enforcement, social work, that only t talks about the proportion of your students that are enrolled. So think of this as like a 100-point test. 
10 points of that is based on how many people you have enrolled in those programs. The earnings don't make any accommodation for that. I think we all know that social workers and education folks do not make very much money. The incentive then, again, would be on the school to steer people away from those lower paying fields because it's their earnings that matter. A very small percentage of this would be based on how many of them are enrolled in those programs. It doesn't matter what field they're in when they're earning, it's just straight up their earnings. So we don't feel like, we think it's very questionable whether institutions of higher education should be in the business of trying to direct people's life choices, whether they want to study in a certain field, get a job in a, stu in a certain field, always take a better paying job, regardless of what family demands or whatever, you know, just all the kind of things that feed into how much money a person is making. If that's the sole determinant, we are not comfortable being put in a position where we are expected, where we're, the incentives the state are giving us are simply to do whatever we can do, and I don't really know how many options we would have to try to get people to make more money, especially retroactively, people that we haven't had on campus in many years, calling them up, trying to get them to tell them, hey, we need you to quit teaching and take a computer science job because we need you to make more money. To me, that, that is a very logical extension of what this system would encourage us to do. And frankly, we don't think that's an appropriate role for higher education institutions. Um, I would also talk about the questions that have come up about um, appropriations and tying the hands of, of budget writers. Um, I'm just gonna read this section of the bill to you. Notwithstanding any other provision of law to the contrary, including appropriations bills, the funds that the General Assembly may appropriate to each university for the purpose of all expenditures shall not exceed the allocation to each university determined under the subsection. So uh, putting aside the questionable ability of, of, of this bill to limit future General Assembly, let's just say that, 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 were, that that's binding, okay? So therefore, you couldn't have any appropriation to a university outside of this system. So for example, the General Assembly and the governor have three years running of doing MoExcel's projects. They've been very successful. We have, a, we have a new autism center at Missouri Southern. We have the first uh, law enforcement academy at an HBCU in the country at Lincoln University because of uh, specific workforce demands that were identified that the General Assembly and the governor put money in for. We have a cybersecurity program that's new at Southeast because of a MoExcels grant. Now, who knows what specific needs we're gonna have in the future. This bill purports to limit the General Assembly's ability to direct any appropriations to a university except for through this system. First of all, I don't think that that's legally binding, but even if it was, I don't think that that's, a, that that's the best way to enhance and improve public education, public higher education in Missouri. Um, the last thing I'll mention on that is that this bill sets up a closed system. This was touched on as well. Everything is based on the money that you got last year. It's just redividing the appropriation you had last year. So again, with this going into effect next year, then this year's appropriation would be the most you could ever appropriate to higher education. You're just rearranging the deck within there based solely on earnings, which are largely out of an institution's control. So yeah, we're not gonna sign up for that. Now, if you are interested, and I think, and I'm glad that you are interested in working on a funding formula, I'll give you some unsolicited advice um, that I've got on the paper here. So the first thing, the most important thing is that there needs to be widespread agreement on what's the goal? What are we trying to accomplish here? 
it sounds simple, but it's proven to be the most difficult part over the years. We've had go governors and general assemblies interested in things like graduation rates, student success rates. We've had other people interested, I know Representative Black, I've talked to him several times about institutional efficiency, you know, student uh, faculty ratios, administrative overhead, things like that. When you've got people have different goals, it's very hard to align your policies accordingly. So before you can get into a funding policy, you have to have broad agreement on goals. It's been mentioned that we have a, a performance funding system in law now, we do. There is a performance funding system in Missouri statute. Um, after it was passed, subsequent general assemblies, especially the budget process, had no interest in it. The next, when, that, when the governor who was the governor when that was passed was no longer governor, the next governor had no interest in it. So if, unless you have that, the kind of broad agreement that supports these things, they're not liable to succeed. So I would encourage you to, to start there. After that, obviously, you need to define and, and uh, explain those goals so that everyone understands them. You need to identify measures that are directly related to those goals. And then you need to identify which of those factors are within the control of a higher education institution. If you want institutions to improve in some way or improve some outcome, you need to pick items that they have some control over. I think it's very questionable whether institutions have a whole lot of control over how much, not whether, not whether people get jobs or not, but how much they're earning. And we certainly don't have control retroactively over that, to go back in time for the foreseeable future trying to get people who've already graduated and somehow cajole them to earn more money. And then lastly, it's important that your funding policies provide the resources that are needed to make improvement. You know, a closed system like the one that's in this bill is not gonna provide additional resources to, to schools that are struggling. Um, it, it might not even provide enough resources for institutions that are doing well to continue doing well. So there has to be mechanisms for policymakers to inject additional resources in for everyone if you're gonna have success. So. I will stop there and happy to answer any questions. Representative Black. To inquire, Madam Chair. Yep, please proceed. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Wagner. And yeah, you and I have talked about this at some time, and there are other factors that I think are worth considering. Uh, I do think performance funding is something we need to look at very, very carefully and could probably be an advantage to our state. The, but I would ask you as a as an expert in this field, to look at this chart. I don't have the chart. I've not I'm seen sorry. The chart. Uh, I'll have to describe it for you then. It describes the. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, it describes uh, earnings ten years out for the various uh, institutions in our state, and. I mean, there's, there's something to be said here someplace, maybe I'm not sure how clearly, uh, for this chart. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Wagner, but it looks like the number one and two institutions in terms of graduation 10 years out are MU and Truman. And if I remember correctly, those are the two most selective admission institutions in our state. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, within University of Missouri, I believe Columbia and Rolla have higher than higher admissions standards than UMSL and UMKC. But yes, Mizzou, Rolla, Truman would be the top three. So I, you know, I guess from a macro perspective, it's really not that astounding that those two institutions would be at the top of the list. But really, I want to point your attention to the third one. And that is, by a fairly significant amount of money, state tech. Yeah. What kind of 
State Tech offers, they offer nursing degrees, they offer health degrees, as well as welding and industrial degrees, isn't that right? Yeah. What conclusion do you draw, if you draw any, or what's your observation with the fact, and, and their funding per student is next to the bottom? Well, uh, what, what conclusions do you draw from that, Mr. Wagner? Okay, two things, stick with me, two things. Well, one, yeah, definitely State Tech does uh, a great job. Their students get jobs. Their students get jobs that are in high demand. Um, you know, simple supply and demand. There's a lot of demand for the programs that they produce uh, graduates from, and and they are they do very well. Um, for the purpose of this bill, to, on your second point, the difference between the it's really state tech is is with the community colleges in this bill. So the. As far as this bill is concerned, the comparison of state tech on per student funding is with the community colleges, not the four years. State tech would get murdered in this bill because they are compared to community colleges and they're not funded like community colleges. They have only two year programs like community colleges, but financially, they're not like community colleges at all. They don't have a local taxing base. So they're funded much more like a four year school so, I mean, I represent state tech as well, and I, I almost forgot to mention that they, they get killed by this thing because they're, 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 they're never going to justify the amount of state funding that they currently get because they're compared to community colleges that, are, for <coughs> reasons like local tax base and such, are funded very differently by the state. That's a very interesting point, and I did not realize that, and thank you for letting us know. I think the issue that I was Actually, actually asking a question about was it would appear that there is some need for some kind of, I don't know if you call it direction or at least information that might, that state tech is apparently getting out uh, that's, that some of the other institutions are not with regard to the success of their students 10 years out. I mean, that's quite a while. Um, I just totally lost my thought. Um, well, state techs, the other th state techs programs are expensive. Community colleges would love to offer a lot of the same programs at the same scale that state tech does, but they are very expensive to offer. Now, the state invests in state tech. The tuition at state tech is much higher than at community college. It's an ex it's an expensive model on the front end, so. We could use more state tax. We could double it. State tech is growing. We could double. It's an expensive proposition to replicate their programs elsewhere. That, thank you. And you point out another factor, which I don't. The, the this is state funding. I don't see in here a category for what the institutions charge, what the private parent funding, whatever you want to call it, might be. So, thank you, Mr. Wagner. Any additional questions of this witness? Representative Wyndham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tim Quire. Yes, please. Thank you for being here. Um, can you tell me about all the things that universities do with their core budget? Well, the, the money that the, that the universities get from the state, as far as like the House Bill 3 core funding, mm -hmm. it's not allocated by the state to anything. So. Um, anything that the university does, everything that the university does is in part underwritten by the state appropriation. There's no s appropriation for teaching, appropriation for financial aid. It's just one lump sum, so to speak. So does this uh, bill take into account, um, for, for one thing, like you said, um, Different different styles of teaching. So uh, the difference between a, a Lynn Tech and a St. Louis uh, Community College, but it the, it also doesn't take into uh, into account as, as far as I could tell. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, so it it also doesn't take into effect uh, how old the the institution is, right? So. Lincoln is one of the oldest institutions in the state. They got to do quite a bit of deferred maintenance and, and all those things. But we would say 
depending on how much their earnings are of their graduates and uh, Hale enrollment, which is only 20 percent. Hell enrollment because of because of those factors, how much money they should get, which goes into uh, in in some effect fixing their, their dilapidated campus or expanding their programs or doing whatever else they need to do in order to improve the institution. Right? Yeah. No. There's. I mean, this is based on how much money your students are earning. If your students, if you're, your not your students, your graduates are earning ten years down the road. If they're earning more, you'll theoretically get more money if they're if they're earning more than the other schools in the state theoretically they would proportionally get more money I guess you could say but really that's that's what this is driven off of not 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 anything else Char other, no characteristics of the institution go into that all right um, and then um, th does do you all have any opinion on uh, how the pill enrollment takes up 30% for the two years and then 20% for the four years? Uh, no, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really get into comparison. Oh, you probably, you probably don't have this either to look at. No, this this is way more handy than trying to read the bill and all the different definitions. I, I'll tell you that for sure. I'm a, I'm a pretty old uh, school nerd. I like to read the bills, but yeah, the chart would be helpful too. Yes. Um, you, you want, well, I, I'll, I'll end my inquiry, so I won't take up the, the, any more of the committee's time. Thank right, you. Thank you. And just real quickly, we'll go past 2 o'clock a little bit today. So, um, Representative Pfeiffer, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, to inquire. Yes, please. Um, and this may be a little bit out of your wheelhouse, but as I was looking at this, do you happen to know in terms of um, – budgeting um, in our land-grant institution, University of Missouri, um, the Extension Division has this whole mandate through the state. Uh, in your reading of this, and I'll, I'll ask about this later, is that taken into account at all? There are no characteristics of, the inst of an institution that's taken into account. So most of what we talked about with land-grant in the building nowadays is trying to make up for the past neglect of Lincoln's land grant. Mm -hmm. Lincoln is a land grant institution as well. That's the kind of thing that wouldn't be allowed anymore if this bill was law. You wouldn't be allowed to make a separate appropriation just to Lincoln for their land grant. Okay. And so all of the extension division work, uh, like with, with soil and animal husbandry and that kind of thing throughout the state might be at risk with this. Well, I think that's fair to say because um, the the institution again, if all of your funding is based on your graduates' earnings, it wouldn't make sense to pursue expenditures that don't relate to that. And research expenditures in fulfillment of a land grant mission doesn't have anything to do with student earnings. It has to do with other roles that the institutions play in society, like University of Missouri does with the ex extensions office, like Lincoln does with it, its extension. So it, it would certainly discourage investment in those types of activities because it doesn't feed into the incentive that your funding is based on. And I do know that there's a federal mandate with extension throughout the, the country. Um, would this then in some ways impinge on federal dollars that come for research and that kind of thing to our state universities? Well, uh, the, the state's only responsibility with that is to, is to match a certain amount. So, I mean, it would, I guess it would be up to the institution, up to University of Missouri and Lincoln, if they wanted to continue to dedicate a portion of their state funding to match their federal land grant money. There are ways for them to pursue waivers and such, but it, it would definitely open up that can of worms. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Veet. Inquire the witness. Please proceed. For instance, next year we have a program that Governor Parsons has indicated, like for our nursing program, that if we build the new school and it's going to cost $40 million, we can potentially get $20 million from the state. Uh, would that all be in jeopardy then, too? Well, I'm not sure if, if the, again, Assuming that this language has legal standing, um, well, we wouldn't pass I, I would say end. yes. I mean, this says it for per, for all expenditures. I mean, a capital appropriation is an expenditure. So, yeah, I would say that under this 
bill, you wouldn't be allowed to make a capital appropriation because that's an expenditure of the university. So no, you would you would not be able to do that. I think you indicated like Lincoln University, University of Missouri. I was up there. They do extensive amount of research. We research, you know, hemp, the best seeds for hemp and all this stuff. That's part of their training, so the students are getting good training. But if we were just mainly teaching, we worry about teaching and not having a practical effect in the development. I mean, that all would be considered as part of their overhead, correct? Yes. The, the, the only, yes. Again, th th this gets to the larger question of what is the purpose of a higher education institution? Is it just to prepare students for the workforce to earn the most money they can? That is certainly a part of an institution's role. But institutions serve <coughs> other roles in society as well, like research, like support of agriculture through extension. And, and those things are not, would no longer be funded by the state. What effect would this have, for instance, on the University of Missouri has a nuclear plant there and does all the research with that? What effect would it have on something like that? Well, I, I don't want to talk yeah. too much for University of Missouri. I'll get out of hand. But I mean, oh. I, I think that's just another example of what I've said where if, 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 if you know, university administrators, if this passes, I mean, sitting around the table saying, well, can we afford to spend money on X if it's not going to, at the end of the day, increase the amount of money our students earn after they graduate? It's going to be tough to justify expenditures that you can't directly tie to how much money are the, is this student going to make in six to ten years. Thank you. And Representative Veep, we have a witness in the back that would be happy to answer that question for you. Is there any other questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you. So is there anybody else here in favor of this? Okay, so we'll have the next. Um, and you're like jumping out of your seat. So I'll let you come up and answer Representative V's question, if you would, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Dusty Schneiders. I'm with the University of Missouri System. And I just want to uh, come up here and say I'm, we're testifying for informational purposes only. Um, there are currently 23 states that have some type of performance funding model. Um, if the state was, if the state decides to go to this direction, um, we believe a formula that, uh, the formula needs to be about student success and student outcomes, where students are graduating on time with lower debt and earning more higher wages. And so um, that's pretty well what I'm here to state, and I can answer some of the questions. Um, that have been brought up. So there's, as I stated, there's 23 states that do this. They all do it differently. Um, there's some states that have these types of uh, this, what uh, the representative has brought to this committee. Uh, but there's also some caveats where uh, they have line items uh, in their but in the higher education budget. So um, there's states that uh, that will pr that will fund um, professional degrees differently. Um, than, than uh, undergraduate degrees. Uh, there's, there's things like that that, that, will, that states do to uh, differentiate some of the things that um, are not in the formula. I'll be happy to answer any questions. So Representative Veet, do you want to ask your question about the nuclear? Sure. How would like the nuclear research we do? Because I was there last week at one of our you know, programs, and they were all, you know, we had the state of the art, and, and our plan is being used by facilities all over the United States and world right now. So how would it affect something like that? Um, you know, that's, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if this bill addresses um, some of those uh, targeted programs uh, that we are currently working on. That's why um, other states have line item uh, line items uh, outside of the formula. And I think that would, the nuclear research reactor would probably um, fall under outside of that scope. Thank you. Representative Adams, please proceed. To inquire uh, or ask a question, and some of these other experts might be able to answer it. Um, St. Louis Community College is 
I believe starting next year, will be offering a baccalaureate degree along with their AA. How will this affect that? <laughs> so, do we have any other questions for the witness that we have at, at, at hand? And we will get back to yours when we get the right person up at the table. Um, Representative Pfeiffer, go right ahead, please. To inquire, Madam yes. Chair. And um, I, I, I'm always going to ask about extension. So um, in terms of the funding of the extension work around the state, mm -hmm. um, in, in a sense that's not directly involved with teaching, and yet it's a good part of the budget of a research university like mm -hmm. land grant university so so how do, is all of that affected in this kind of funding mechanism um the, the bill sponsor and i have talked a, a little bit about this um as he stated uh um there could be changes to the bill um there's there's some kinks that we you know could work out uh it, we were concerned uh, with the, the not being recognized for the land grant status, um, so you know, as I stated, um, there, you know, we could. There's 23 other states that do something like this, um, and if the state uh, wants to go into this direction, uh, we want to just be a, a seat at the table and be a resource for for you guys to bounce ideas off of. Do you have any idea what any of the other states do, uh, do with their land-grant universities? Uh, so Tennessee has a line item for land-grants, uh, for the, the land-grant status. Okay. And and do you have any idea of what percentage of the budget of the university goes to extension currently? No, I don't. Okay. Thank you. Representative Wyndham. Proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so you read, you, you don't read the, uh, this, what's this, the sixth page, the 75th line, the, the same way is, uh, is, is Kofi that you won't be able to have any other expenditures or operation costs to exceed the allocation determined under the subsection. I do not have a bill on me currently. Um. Do we have any extra bills, Madam Chair? This isn't the whole bill. It's just a no, summary sorry, and the fiscal note. So it's the sixth page. The um, Let's see. I don't want to have to count subsections here. It's the last paragraph, basically, line 75. So I read that as this bill says that we appropriate X amount of dollars to Mizzou and we can't appropriate X plus anything. It has to be X. It can't be X plus the nuclear lab. Mm -hmm. It can't be X plus uh, any any projects anywhere else. It's just X. Yeah, we would not like that. If, I, I mean, <laughs> is, is that how... <laughs> is, is, is that how you interpret it as well, though? Um, yeah, we would. Yes. Okay. And then uh, secondarily, you, you, you testified that the University of Mizzou would like for, uh, for a formula to be focused on student outcomes. What about uh, inclusivity like open enrollment schools like Missouri Western or um, schools like... Um, Aristotle. Well, I, I, I stated that if the state would go into this direction, mm -hmm. we, we would be open to talking and, you know, have a seat at the table. Okay. I, that, that doesn't really answer the question, but okay. Um, okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions for this witness? Thank you very much. Um, any question or anybody in opposition?
Thank Good you. Proceed when you're ready. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. I'm Brian Milner. I'm the Executive Director of the Missouri Community College Association. I'm here today to go on record uh, in opposition uh, of the bill, but uh, I don't want to be viewed as just oppositional. Um, I've had a couple conversations with the sponsor about this bill, and we are very appreciative of the work that has gone into it, um, how much time and effort he's thought about it, and I know that many of you have as well. Um, we are generally supportive of an effort to create a funding formula that would adequately fund public higher education institutions in the state of Missouri. Um, one of the things that we talked about is in 2002, our community colleges were funded at a total level of $153 million, and in 2022, we are funded at a total of $156 million. And so, you know, from our estimation, the first thing that we would like to see as part of any sort of performance funding proposal is an increase for institutions that are doing uh, doing a good job, right, that are, that are viewed as succeeding and meeting whatever metrics are decided. There are already metrics in statute, as has already been described. Uh, we worked with members of the legislature um, to create those, and uh, th there was a lot of good work done to sort of come up with those. Um, you know, and then I think the other piece that has kind of been, been, been touched on, and I'm going to do my best not to repeat anything that Paul said, he made a lot of very good points. I would agree with the vast majority of any, everything he said, um, and certainly the things that apply for both two-year and four-year institutions. Um, but the one thing is, uh, you know, we have consistently, as community colleges, been asked to do more with less. We do significantly more technical, high-cost training than we did 20 years ago when our, when our funding sort of stagnated. Um, and so the other thing that I discussed with the bill sponsor is any performance funding model uh, for community colleges would, from our from our position, need to include uh, appropriate funding for those higher cost programs. So we do a lot of the programs, many of the programs that State Tech uh, offers, community colleges offer as well, and then there are certainly some that we can't afford to offer, and that's why they have kind of a specialization in that area. Um, but welding, you know, lineman training, um, respiratory therapy, and other kind of high cost uh, allied health programs, we're doing all of those, and we figured out a way to do them without increased state dollars. And um, so that certainly has to be a part of the conversation for us. Uh, happy to answer any, any questions and I'll, I'll kind of leave it there so as to not repeat anything. Representative Adams. Nope. Yeah, a question. And some of the other people might be able to give me an answer to eventually or maybe offline. What level would you need to be at before this program could ever kick in? because I know the community college is severely underfunded. And if this would lock you in at that level, I mean, what level would you have to be at before you could ever think of something like that? Yeah. And I, I don't even expect an answer from you. But sure. No, 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 and I appreciate it. And, and I, I don't think I can give you one, not because I, I want to skirt the question. I just, I, I don't know that we know that answer, um, especially if there's, you know, if there's a potential for no additional increases in perpetuity, um, I, I, I'm not sure that there's, I, I'm not sure there's any way that we could be supportive of that because our costs go up just like the cost to operate a business go up. It costs more to pave a parking lot today than 20 years ago or to keep the lights okay. on, whether we're doing a good job at, uh, educating students or not, right? These are, these are costs that go up, health insurance premiums for our faculty and staff. Yeah. So as uh, public institutions, we have to have the necessary support uh, from the state in order to ensure we can keep you know, covering those costs as well. And I do have a question. What happens to those two-year schools that are now offering that baccalaureate degree? Yeah. How does that figure? How do they? How do you calculate that? Yeah, that's a great question. So I don't know that they would be impacted uh, under this okay. bill only because, um, I mean, I guess those programs would just go into the total algorithm, right? The total, the total formula. Um, so I, I don't, I don't think it would hurt or, or help us kind of one way or the other. And they're going to be such a one-off, right? That, that, um, uh, bachelor's in respiratory therapy is the first of its kind in Missouri. And, and I think it's a, it's an outlier. I don't think it's a trend. So, um, yeah, so I'm, it, but who knows, right? I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't see it impacting us from a funding model perspective. Sure. And didn't MCC... Weren't they just approved for a bachelor's? Yes. So, so Metropolitan, St. Louis Community College, and, and OTC, Den Springfield, were all approved for the same program. The minimum standard uh, change to a baccalaureate degree, it's a space we've operated in, and so okay. we were approved out for those programs. Any other questions for this witness? 
Thank you very much. Do we have anybody else here for informational purposes? Anybody here um, in opposition? I'll go back one time. Um, I will, and we didn't have anybody else that was going to speak in support, so I'll let the bill sponsor come back up. He, he looks like he wants to address this one last time, and we're going to get this done in a time frame. We can all get to our next meeting, so thank you very much. Representative, please proceed. I just wanted to thank you, Madam Chairman, for giving this opportunity to have the bill, and for the committee members. This was very interesting. I think what we found out is, in my opinion, is most people think we probably need a, I say most people, a, a funding formula of some type, and there's a lot of things we have to work into it. And I'm bringing this bill forward because I do believe that that's the best path forward for Missouri to get our workforce where we need it to be. And I appreciate you taking the time to hear this bill. Thank you very much. Um, seeing no further witnesses, I will conclude the hearing on House Bill 2600.